Uh, it's said that families do everything together, right? When you do life together, you do everything together. Families worship, they play, they laugh, they love, they eat. And one reality of that is sometimes they fight. Uh, I grew up with two other brothers. I'm the youngest of three. We're all within five years of each other. So you can imagine occasionally there were some fights in our house. I remember my middle brother, Connor, who is my best friend. I remember when we would practice our WWE moves on, a, on each other. Uh, of course, there was always a bed. So when you, you know, choke slammed your brother or you, you know, whatever you did, you flipped him, you threw him down, you were safe. But I remember that one day where my brother practiced sweet chin music, where you would kick your, your opponent in the chin and he kind of kicked, and he wasn't supposed to hit my face, but he hit me in the nose. That was a fun day in the Arvin household. Uh, I'll tell you, one of the worst moments of my life, just in terms of being embarrassed, was when I was very angry at Connor. Again, that's a theme of my childhood. We were angry for some reason, and he ran to his room and shut the door, and I did not stop my fist. And there's a hole in that door to this day. Yes, your preachers are not perfect. Uh, and so I, I remember being 16 and doing that. And I live in that same house today with him. So it's kind of funny now when you walk by the hall and you see that hole in the door. And if someone says, well, what's that from? Well, let's not talk about it. Uh, but it's a great reminder for me of maybe the uh, dangers of anger. But family fights. And as the church, we are the bride of Christ. We are God's, uh, Jesus's body. We collectively make it up. We are individually members of it. Uh, we're called a family because we are. Uh, we do life together. And that means we do so much together. And sometimes, unfortunately, we fight too. Now, I, I don't mean we physically fight. I pray that brothers and sisters never come to blows. Uh, I would hope that's not the case. I hate the fact that brothers and sisters fight, period. Um, but sometimes we get into these little uh, conflicts and scuffles and spats and disagreements and arguments and you name it. It's one of our worst traits as humans, right, that we don't always get along. And, and that's just reality of, of our experience. It seems like the more time we spend with anyone who is not ourself, the more likely it is we, that we get into disagreements or arguments, disputes or problems. Um, sometimes we annoy each other. No one amen that, so that's a good sign, I guess. But sometimes we annoy each other. It's like some of us are professionals at getting under each other's skin. Uh, sometimes we can't seem to see eye to eye on anything. Uh, sometimes we leave people feeling overlooked or unheard, or feeling unseen. Sometimes we say mean things, whether that's with good intentions and it comes out wrong or with bad intentions. Sometimes we make assumptions about our brothers and sisters Sometimes we hurt each other's feelings. Sometimes we're selfish. Sometimes we don't follow through with our words. Sometimes we don't treat each other the way we want to be treated. None of those are excused, but that's the truth, right? That's what happens when you're working together towards a common goal, when you care about one another, when you spend a good amount of time with each other, you get into it from time to time. It's the truth that sometimes we get into it, we fight a little bit because we sin. And sometimes we sin against each other. Uh, church, if the world is ever going to know us, uh, they're going to know us by our love for one another. If they're going to know we are Christians, they will know it by our love. And that's, that's how we treat the world. But if we're going to treat the world with a love like Jesus, it, it better start in here, shouldn't it? It better start between each other. How are we going to love the world, non-Christians, if we can't love other Christians? It's got to be both ways. If we love the world but don't love our brethren, that's sad. But if we love our brethren and don't love the world, that's sad too. But it starts with how we treat each other. And one way they will know we are Christians by our love is by how we handle our conflicts. And how we handle the situations or times where we get into it with each other. We're meant to spend eternity together. Don't you think we should get along now? We're going to spend a lot of time together. <laughs> Maybe we should work on how we spend it together now. So if you have your Bible, open up to Philippians chapter 4. As we talk about uh, when the family fights, if you're visiting with us, or maybe you're wondering this as someone who attends here or is part of this family. This was not a sermon written because of something going on here before you start speculating in your brain. No one's been having fist fights in the parking lot during service. No one has said anything about someone else and I've heard about it and said, I just want to talk about it. No, 
This is just something I thought would be good uh, from what I was studying. Paul wrote to a church that he loved dearly. Uh, the Philippian church was one that he had visited, that he had spent some time with. It was a church that supported him as a missionary. They, they supported him spiritually with their prayers. They supported him financially on his journeys or while he's in prison because he is writing this from prison. And he makes this statement in Philippians chapter 4 verses 2 and 3 that you might think they just come out of the blue uh, if, when you read this letter. Uh, just read it with me in Philippians 4 verse 2. Uh, I'm reading the ESV. It says, I entreat Yodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Paul mentions these two women. I don't know if I'm saying their names right. I've never met a Yodia and I've never met a Syntyche, but that's what I'm guessing their names are. As Marty said this morning, that's how it sounds to an American, so it must be right. I don't know. But that's their two names. And his message for them is, Agree in the Lord. Maybe your version says, have the same mind or live in harmony. Uh, this word that he uses, uh, its root of it means it's, he's talking about the way you think. Um, he's saying, ladies, have the same attitude. That's what that word means. And he mentions this word 11 times in this book. In four chapters, he talks about your mindset or how you lead your mind to think or your attitude. And he says, ladies, you need to have the same mind. You need to be living harmoniously. You need to have the same attitude. You need to get your minds back on the same page. You need to lead your minds to think a certain way. We have no idea why they weren't getting along. Not a clue. It could be, you know, we could speculate all day long, but I want you to notice he doesn't blame one or the other. He doesn't say, now you're being ugly, you're okay. He doesn't say... It, this really is your fault. He says, no, you two need to live in harmony. You need to get it together. Have the same attitude. He doesn't mention a problem of teaching or beliefs. Doesn't seem to be something doctrinal. Uh, it's probable and most likely that this was either a difference of opinion or my view or my thought would be it's a personality clash. You ever have those people that you, you don't seem to mesh with naturally? You know, someone that, uh, you know, it just seems like we're always button heads or whatever. Maybe it's that. But there's something going on here that's causing these two ladies to not be united in mind. And so maybe it's a difference of opinion or a personality clash, which, by the way, are what divide, that's what divides the church most today. We think it's beliefs and it's things like that. But when you look in the Lord's church, most times when a church splits or things like this happen, it's personality issues. It's differences of opinion that get ran and taken too far and you might think well why is that a big deal you know these two women are fighting why did Paul think it was necessary at the end of this letter to just say hey by the way you two women get it together like stop the cat fight let's let's figure this out well it's because well there's a few reasons but I want you to notice how important it is to him look at that verse again I entreat I don't know what your version says it might say urge uh, I'm, you know, it's this idea of I plead and in, in the original language, that's a petition verb, which means when they would read this, there would be flashing signs next to this. You know, like, hey, look at this neon sign. Like when your parents said you by your full name, Jonathan Wesley Arvin, like, oh, OK, I need to pay attention. It's, hey, I'm urging you. I'm urging you. Listen to this. And I'm urging you, ladies, you need to be uh, in harmony and so this was a big deal. The only two types of verbs we see in this whole letter are right here. This is the most emphasis he gives to any command in the letter, and it was to two women who weren't getting along. And so he says, hey, please listen to this and, and get it together. And this is a big deal because this issue between them doesn't only affect their relationship, but it can affect all the relationships in the church. It can affect the unity of the church. When we have issues with people, unfortunately, we tend to pull other people onto our sides, don't we? Two people aren't getting along, and what do we do? We go talk to them. No. We go talk to other people about them. And we'll talk about that a little later. And we say, hey, affirm how I feel about this. And then you should think similarly about this person. And we divide. I mean, we joke about having different sides of the congregation, right? We were joking about that before service. But... That's what happens sometimes when we get in disputes. We start pulling people to our side. And that's a disaster for God's family. That is a recipe for disaster. 
Because we can't all be one if we're choosing sides. It's impossible. And so it's a big deal. That's not what the body of Christ was made for. It's not why Jesus sacrificed himself for us. We're meant to be family, not foes, to be working together, not against each other. So he addresses this fight. And you might think he doesn't say too much about this situation. But I believe when you think about this issue and then you go back and read the letter, there is a lot that applies to these two ladies and their situation. And so what would Paul say to these two women and to us when we get in fights with one another or we get into it? Look at chapter 2 and verse 2. We read this a few weeks ago and we talked about being a servant like Jesus. We'll look at it again. But the first passage and the first thing that I see in this book that Paul would say to these women and to us is you need to have Jesus's attitude of humility. You need to have Jesus's attitude of humility. Look at verse two through verse eight. Uh, we'll start in verse one. Actually, Paul would say, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there's any comfort from love, if there's any participation in the spirit or any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind. Having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled, humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. This section appears to be the heart of this whole letter. And it greatly applies to these women and it greatly applies to us when we have situations similar to this. That word that Paul used in chapter 4 and verse 2 for live in harmony or have one mind, he uses that word four times in verse 2 through 5. You don't read it because it's not the same word in English, but in, in their language, it's the same word. He would say in verse 2, have the same mind. Same word. He'd also tell them have the same love. Uh, verse 2, he would say, be united in spirit and mind, or that in full accord. That word mind again, that's again another time he uses it. In verse 3, in humility count others more significant than yourself. That word humility, same word. Uh, verse 5, have this mind or have this attitude. That's the same word. He's, he's addressing a lot about their situation just by what he's talking about here. And Paul's plea for these women is please humble yourself. Have some humility. You need to lower your view of yourself. You might be a little big headed. You might be thinking you deserve it all. You might think everything should go your way. You might be thinking about how right you are in this situation. That's your pride talking. Humble yourself. When we fight, we typically are looking out for ourselves, our way, our thoughts, what we want. And verse 4, he says what? Look not only to your interests, but look to the interests of others. It's like, hey, you need to have some humility. Have you thought about the other person? Have you put yourself in their shoes? What are they thinking? Uh, it says, humble yourself. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit in verse 3. But humility, count yourself, uh, count others more significant than yourself. Most of our conflicts are either created, continued, or they never cease because of conceit or selfishness. Just think about your life and all the times you get into other people. Aren't most of those because of selfishness or conceit? When we're only thinking about us, when we're too high and mighty, we don't tend to resolve things that happen or we're too proud to go handle something correctly. We just let it sit there and fester or we wait because we're in the right. And that's not the attitude of Jesus. And Paul reminds us of that by looking at the example of him. If anybody had the right to be conceited, it's Jesus. If anybody had the right to look at himself very highly, it's Jesus. And yet he willingly lowered himself in every way for eternity for a people who did not deserve it. There's no selfish ambition or conceit in the example we find in Jesus. Yet we sometimes get into other people and we think we're too good or too great or too high or we're too stubborn or prideful to lower ourselves and go handle it properly or forgive or whatever it may be. And Jesus shows a different example. Most, if not all of our fights 
would not exist if we thought about the attitude of Christ. If we thought about the God who went to a cross, if we thought about him before we spoke or we acted or we continued in conflict, our conflicts would cease. The attitude of Jesus is completely opposite from the attitude of, I'll forgive when they come to me first. The attitude of Jesus is different from, well, I don't care what they think because I'm right. I know I'm right in this situation. The attitude of Jesus is different from, well, why should I go to them when they took it the wrong way? The attitude of Jesus is different from, can you believe what they said or did? Let me talk to you about it. If we would put on humility, there is not a conflict in the church that couldn't be handled with love and relationships that could not be restored. So we need to check our attitude when we fight, or when we have these situations. There's, all, there's almost always adjustments that need to be made within our mind. And it all starts with humility. So one passage and one point that Paul makes that I believe uh, applies to these ladies and also to us when we get into conflicts with our brothers or sisters is we need to put on the attitude of Jesus. And that's a humble attitude. We need to check our attitude. But then secondly and lastly, the passages that I believe apply to the situation is in chapter 1. Look at chapter 1 and verse 3. When it comes to when families fight, and, and we're talking about a church family, although I think a lot of this applies maybe to a physical family too. Um, once again, not sharing this because there's something bad going on, just or that I expect it to happen, or I want it to happen. But you never know. So, hey, I thought I'd share some. But look at chapter 1 and verse 3. Paul says here as he starts this letter, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you with all the affection of Jesus Christ, or how I yearn for you all with the affection. But notice, secondly, I think Paul would want us to remember that God's family is more important than our fights. That this family is more important than whatever comes between us. When he opened this letter, he mentions how frequently he prays for this church. And I want you to notice some of the words he uses as he talks about his feelings towards them. Verse 3, he says, I thank my God. I am grateful for you. Every time I pray, I, every time I pray about you, it's thanksgiving. Every time I think of you. When you think of your brothers and sisters, is that what you think of every time you think of them? I'm thankful I am grateful. I'm, I'm so glad for who they are and, and what God has blessed me with with them. And verse 4, as he talks about these prayers he mentions up on their behalf, he says, and I pray with joy. This church, this family I'm a part of, they bring me so much joy. And then in verse 7, he says the word heart. I hold you in my heart. There is affection. There is love. And my favorite phrase in all of that passage it is only right for me to feel this way about you all. I mean, how else should I feel about my brothers and sisters in Christ? Like, how else should I feel for the body of people, for the family God has blessed me with, for the people who are in the same Jesus that I am in? How, what else should I think but to be thankful, to be grateful, to be joyful, to have love for them? Paul had a high view of his brothers and sisters. How do we view ours? How do we feel about each other? You know, it's easy to feel that way about that person that sits behind you, in front of you, to your right or to your left, that you, that you sit next to every time you're in the building. What about that one person that has a completely opposite personality that you don't get along with very well? What about the person that, you know, uh, just annoys you a little bit from time to time? What about that person you had, had, you had a rough encounter with one time? Or they said something and you took it the wrong way. Or you wondered if they were looking at you sideways when really they, they weren't. Or they were. I don't know. But how do you view your brothers and sisters? All of them. Because when it came to Paul, his disposition to the, his church family was one of gratitude, joy, and love. And when one of his brothers or sisters popped up in thought or conversation or prayer, whatever or however it may be, he had a deep affection for them. And that should be the case for us too. Paul knew this church. He had been with them before. And I would imagine he knew they weren't perfect people. 
I don't think Paul's saying, I am thankful and joyful and I love you because you're perfect. Paul might have had some people there he didn't naturally get along with. or so There might have been some personalities that rubbed him the wrong way. But yet when he thought of them, he said, I can only be thankful for you. And I love the why that he mentioned in those verses. It's because of what they shared. He says, you are fellow partakers of grace with me. You partake in the same grace with me. This church supported him financially and spiritually while he was in prison and in his work. And he could be mentioning that. But he also could be mentioning this idea of we share the same God. We have received the same mercy and grace, the same forgiveness. How could I think anything else but that of you? We have both been forgiven, been touched by Jesus in a special way. We both love him and are serving him. And I'm thankful for you because of that. Out of all the people we know, shouldn't we deeply love those who follow Jesus too? Amen. Shouldn't we be thankful for those who have chosen Jesus? I mean, we live in a world where so many don't. And yet, with the people who do, we should be thankful. Shouldn't we be joyful that we get to work together? Amen. That we're not doing this alone, that we get to have a common goal. Um, Shouldn't we hold each other in our hearts when we're walking with Jesus in a world that's so against him? We have to remember God's family is more important than the fight. Those fights are so minor and they're so little and yet we blow them up and make them bigger. And we let them come between people that God died for. We must remember God's family is more important than the fight. Building matters should not come between us. Personality differences should not divide us. Angry wor words need to be forgiven. Whatever it is, it's not bigger than who we are together in Christ. God died to restore a relationship with us. He wants us not only to be in harmony with him, but he wants us to be in harmony with each other. And so we need to seek out resolution when we have issues together. It's never more important than God's family, whatever it is. And so what do we do when we fight? Because those are two passages that apply to those situations. But what do we actually do? I have three answers for you if you're taking notes. And if you're not taking notes, I, I just I pray that you'll hear this. When we fight, number one, we need to talk to them, not about them. Talk to them, not about them. The most common response and reaction of a human when we have issues with another is the opposite of how God instructs us to deal with these issues with other people. One thing that we do is we hold on to it instead of handle it. You know, when someone says something rude to you or they lie to you or whatever it might be, that hurts. And instead of going and telling them that and trying to resolve it, we just take it and we put it somewhere within us and we just let it sit and grow. And we get more angry and calloused about it and we think about it and it affects us in a negative way and it affects the church in a negative way. And so we, we hold on to it. But we don't actually handle it, which goes against what Jesus would say in Matthew chapter five, verse 23 and 24. He would tell them, you know, if if you go to the altar and you're about to sacrifice to the altar and you know you have a brother who is ought with you, he says, leave your leave your gift and go be reconciled with your brother. You know, like if we're sitting here tonight and we're singing to God and we have an issue with a brother or sister, God is much more interested in you going and being reconciled to your brother than he is in your worship. Because there is nothing more that would please God than to see two of his people be back together in a right relationship than to, than to you to sing or worship or pray or whatever it may be while you're angry with a brother or sister. And so instead of holding on to it and not dealing with it, because sometimes that's what we do. You know, sometimes there's people in churches who they've been mad at somebody for 20 years. And some of you giggle at that, but have you met someone like that? Are you like that? Because we're really good, and I'm me included, at keeping grudges and holding on to them. And we sit here and we say, oh, Jesus is Lord, and I love my, a common love for each other. I can't stand my brother. I just remixed that for you off the top of my head. Like, we, 20 years, we're just angry. You go to them. You know, another thing we do is, okay, we'll talk about it, but we don't talk to it. We don't talk to them about it. Let me go tell everyone else but the person. It's like, oh, you didn't know? Everyone else does. We gossip. 
That's what that is. Uh, We slander that other person because we tell other people the story and what happened. And we hope that they'll think about that person or about the situation like we do, that they'll affirm our side of the situation. And by doing that, we create a bigger divide and a bigger problem by talking to everyone else but them. That shouldn't be the case. One thing we do is we go tell leadership. We go to elders and we go to ministers and deacons and and we come to them and we tell them the situation, but we don't go talk to our brother and sister. Hey, listen, elders, elders, listen to me. This is for you. When people do not listen to that conversation. Did I say elders listen to this and then my mic turned off? <laughs> Man, you elders, I got, do we need to have a talk? Like, I didn't know they gave Harold, like, you know, mic uh, power. He's just up here going, oh, nope, don't want to hear that. Uh, I'll, I'll repeat it. Elders, listen to me, though. When people come to you about somebody else, do not listen to that conversation. Don't. If they have not gone to their brother or sister, it's not a conversation you should be a part of. Church, do not go to your leadership about your brother or sister. Go to your brother or sister. That is step one, two, and three. You might want some wisdom on how to approach somebody. Okay. You might try to go to that person. And it does not work out as you try to resolve it. And God has some instructions about that when someone sins against you. Or, you know, maybe it's I need help from a brother to help resolve that situation. But first and foremost, you always go to your brother and sister. Leaders are not meant to be the button that we press every time there's a conflict, a problem, or a complaint. And so while elders can be helpful or or a resource, a source of counsel to how to approach somebody, we should always go to the person Go to your brother and sister. 99% of conflicts would be handled if we went to each other. Almost all of our issues would be handled if we talked to people and not about people. Uh, Relationships be restored, and it will bless you just as much as it will bless them if you go to them. And so one is talk to people, not about them. Secondly, check your thinking. Uh, Look at Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Paul says another phrase or, or another, another statement that has broader application but also would apply in this situation too. In Philippians 4 and verse 8, he would say this, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think on these things or think about these things. That when we get into conflicts with one another, we should check our thinking. I don't know if you're like me, but when you have issues with people or when they hurt you or they insult you or they gossip, you, whatever it is, don't you tend to sometimes start thinking the worst about that person? It's like, you know those coloring sheets we give our kids that they never actually color within the lines, they just go bananas all over the page. But it's like if we had a picture of a person and it just had a, a line that we colored in. It's like once they insult us, we color them with that whole action they did. Like we take that hurt or that insult or that dirty look or that disagreement, and we just shade the person completely that way. Nah, we need to check our thinking. We, we focus on the bad in that person instead of the good. We think the worst of them sometimes. It's, it's our reaction as a human. Look, we might get on each other's nerves or we might disagree. We might say the wrong thing. We might hurt each other. But that does not mean everything about each other is bad. Any brother or sister that you have a conflict with, there is still a lot of wonderfully good things about that brother or sister. There is something still praiseworthy and honorable about them. And we need to remember that. We shouldn't paint people with broad brushes. Instead, we should remember like Paul did that this person is my family. This is God's child. This is God's body. This is somebody who needs grace like myself. This is somebody who Jesus died for. This is somebody who has shortcomings and is human like me. And the issues that I have with them, well, I have issues myself. Okay, they weren't perfect. Well, guess what? I'm not either. And it'd be a lot better off if we would think about that, that our need for grace applies to that person that we're having an issue with. And so we need to check our thinking because ours might be wrong too. It's very possible both people's thinking is wrong. Um, I sat in a leadership class with a man by the name of Ken Jones, if that's familiar with you. He used to be the president at Lubbock Christian University years ago. He does some stuff with Oklahoma Christian now, I believe. But he has these principles of life that he lives by and he taught his sons. And some of you maybe heard this before. And one that he, he said that I thought was really powerful was, it's this quote, he says, maybe the fault is mine. 
He says, in life, in every situation, whatever goes wrong, whatever happens, I always say to myself, ask myself, maybe the fault is mine. Like, where am I, where am I wrong in this? Like, what maybe mistakes did I make? Is there something I said, or did I react poorly, or how have I handled this? And when it comes to our conflict, maybe we should ask ourselves that sometimes. Maybe the fault's mine. Hey, where am I helping this situation or hurting this situation? And so we need to check our thinking. Maybe our thinking is leading to part of the problem. Maybe the fault is mine too. And then lastly and shortly is this. Help repair the bridge. Don't burn it. We just talked about that all summer. But is this conflict or how we're handling it, is it building a bridge or is it damaging one? If anybody ever comes to you with an issue about somebody else, your first response should always be, it sounds like you need to talk to them about it. Okay, church, let's, let's put that into practice. Like, let's get that memorized. If someone ever comes to you about someone else, another brother or sister say, hey, it sounds like you need to talk to them about this, not me. Leave gossip. Lies or truth about someone else that has no business for you is gossip. Um, change conversations. Encourage reconciliation. When you know a brother and sister have an issue or a brother and a brother have an issue, encourage reconciliation at every, every chance. And remind each other that we all need grace and mercy. And that will be an environment and a community and a culture that promotes brothers and sisters going to each other, being reconciled, and that's very pleasing to God. They will know us by our love. That's not only by how we treat each other, and I hope that we love each other in a way where we don't have conflicts and fights, and that shouldn't be an often thing, but when it happens, we will show them our love by how we handle it. And so we go to each other. So remember, our attitude, put on an attitude of humility. Remember that we need to think like Paul and that our family is far more important than our fights and that we need to talk to people, not about them. We need to check our thinking and we need to repair a bridge. Uh, my invitation for you is not the classic invitation. It is simply this. Tonight, if you have a problem with a brother or if you know a brother or a sister has a problem with you, your challenge tonight, your goal, what God is pleading with you to do, he's urging you is that you need to go to them you need to think highly of them. You need to check your thinking and you need to repair that bridge. That will be more important to God than any word you're about to sing. If you will go to them and work on that. That might be nobody tonight. That might be a few of you. That might be something you need to do right now. It might be something that is going to work on your heart this week and maybe you need to call. You might even call someone and say, I don't know if I offended you, but maybe I did. Have I? I don't know. But that's your invitation tonight. So as we stand and we sing, think about that.